and then you can, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the first session of Programmed Ontologies, How to Code a World with Enzia Bossetti and Danielle Williams. Um, good to read the course description. Our world is a manifestation of complex, adaptive, and intelligent systems. This workshop draws parallels between existing models of complexity and material, biological and physical systems, and extends further than the mere replication of matter and nature. Algorithmic design research blurs traditional disciplinary boundaries, bridging multiple scientific and artistic fields, and has the capacity to develop a deeper dialogue with a variety of scales and their interrelation. The ubiquity of our digital tools has made design and the manipulation of information inseparable. Our speculation is that computation is not solely digital, but omnipresent. Matter is increasingly indiscernible from media. A plethora of different scales of time, from the genetic to the geological, are in direct contact with our abstract predictive models, computational infrastructures, and technical apparatuses. In our contemporary post-human context, our hybrid languages increase their potency of affection of the real through a procedurally bound acceleration. We seek novel elements and patterns of organization, structure, and articulation as informational systems with spatio-temporal spatio manifestations. The workshop focuses on the creation of adaptive algorithmic systems and coded worlds. The research will showcase the organizational and spatial characteristics of algorithmic procedures. The goal of the research includes the careful calibration of each process of formation, the curation of precise interactions between an ecology of algorithmic logics and data sets, and the study of the entropy and regenerative phase spaces. The study of algorithmic formation is always a process of negotiation. Data and its manifestations, manifestation withdraws relative to different perspectives. Notions of projection, intersection, mapping, and embedding are lenses of perception of abstract figures whose structure always escapes a complete representation. All different data dimensions enter a flat ontology with no preconceived hierarchical relationships between them. The generative potentiality is encapsulated in a non-representational and almost anti-figurative nexus of qualities. So Enzio and Danielle are founders of Meta Design LLC. Um, it's an architectural design, advanced robotic fabrication, computational design research, algorithmic and machine learning research in geometry and representation, interactive media installations, set design and narrative spaces. Danielle Willems is a design, designer professor and currently is, a part, is partnered in Meta Designs LLC. Her work is recently published in the book titled 57 Pavilions, which showcases design research and built architectural work. Her design practices recently completed a series of projects in Europe that question the intersections um, uh, between algorithmic tools and digital fabrication techniques. She's exhibited in the 2018 Venice Biennale with an installation titled Digital Disposition, which explored functioning blockchain technology embedded within innovative robotically fabricated material composites. She holds a master's of science in advanced architecture design from Columbia University and a bachelor's in architecture from the Southern California Institute of Architecture. She's been a faculty lecturer and critic at several universities and institutions such as Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Cooper Union, Columbia University, and is currently a lecturer at University of Pennsylvania Penn Design and Pratt Institute in the architecture department. Her work progressively merges several disciplines together, such as VR game design, fashion design, robotics, and film into her architecture design methodologies. Enzio Bossetti, a registered architect in Europe, holds a master's of science in advanced architecture design from Columbia University, after having previously studied in Athens and Paris. His academic and professional research focuses on the application of advanced technologies in all phases of architectural design, from the initial composition to the digital and robotic fabrication. He is a founding partner in Meta Design, an architectural design and research firm based in Brooklyn, New York, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Athens, Greece. In 2009, he co-founded, I'm sorry if I mispronounce this, ALO, an architectural design and construction practice, as well as Apo McKean's, an annual intensive design lab on algorithmic processes and fabrication. Founder of algorithmicdesign.net, Enzio 
recent collaborations include New Territories, BioThing, Iconisi Studio, AOM Studio, um, and Serge Studio. He has taught generative design studios and, semin and seminars by means of computational geometry and digital fabrication at Penn Design, Yale School of Architecture, Pratt Institute, Columbia University, Rensselaer Polytech, Polytechnic University, Sci Arc, Cooper Union, the Architectural Association, Michigan University, University of Technology, Sydney, and the Bartlett. In 2004, he co-founded OTN Studio, a young design built practice, build practice, and completed several design projects in Greece. His work has been exhibited and published internationally, including the Pompidou Center, the Venice and Chicago Biennale, and the National Contemporary Arts Museum of Greece. With that, I'm gonna hand the mic over to the instructors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the amazing introduction. Thank you for the amazing introduction. We were not quite expecting this, in fact. Um, we were, um, it's a long list of things and it makes me look older. Um, welcome everyone. I'm um, really happy to be here. It's, re it's really exciting actually to be part of um, the new center. It's the first seminar that we teach uh, together with the new center for research and practice. Um, you want to say something additional to yourself? I think this was a long introduction. Um, we were, yeah, I mean, we were planning to do a really short, like two second introduction of ourselves, but um, after this, maybe you guys have a better idea, at least where we come from and a little bit for our practice um, and where we typically spend our time in academia, primarily on the East Coast in the United States, but also around the world. Um, it's, um, it's also really exciting uh, to be part of the new certificate, the new program at the new center, uh, the post-planetary um, universal design program. Um, we were hoping during our session to get a better idea of uh, who in this, uh, this particular group will be joining us for the rest of the sessions uh, of this coming year. Um, and we'll give you guys enough time to introduce yourselves in a few minutes. Um, but also we were planning to do a joint session together with uh, Ed Keller and uh, Carla Leitao from a UM studio. Introduction. Uh, like an, an introduction, introduction session, let's say to the overall certificate and to the, to the group that might follow us throughout uh, different seminars this coming year. Right. Maybe you wanna add something? Uh, no, I was just saying, welcome to the course. Um, again, my name is Daniel Willems. This is Alcia Blazetti. Um, and we're really excited uh, to bring you um, this, this first couple of sessions. Um, in fact, since, um, since we already kind of went quickly through the syllabus, I assume that all of you guys have gotten our short description um, and, and schedule, right, for, um, for the seminar. This, um, this seminar is kind of, it's a little bit of accumulation of, um, of, let's say, different, both conceptual, let's say, underpinnings behind their work uh, of the last 15 years, but also, let's say, specific techniques that uh, try to engage that work on a more hands-on kind of, uh, let's say, production manner. Um, the quick, the short syllabus that we send you guys kind of, uh, let's say, outlines the first four sessions. And these four sessions are supposed to be um, working in parallel with the studio of uh, Ed Keller and Carla Leitao, which we will also be joining, but also it's the first in a three, um, three course, right, uh, seminars. Uh, Marks has an introduction into how to code the word, right? And uh, coming in the summer in the next fall will be how to code an atmosphere and ultimately a cosmos. Um, what we prepared for you guys, just to give you a bit of an idea for the schedule of today is we have a, about a 45 minute, about an hour, kind of long presentation um, uh, with a series of visuals that are primarily from prior work uh, of ours and our students. And we'll give you guys a bit of a conceptual, let's say under uh, background to the type of work we'll be doing in the seminar. Um, we are going to also leave you guys enough time uh, for a general discussion after the presentation. And then we were hoping to reserve about an hour um, into uh, more of a technical in the sense of getting our hands dirty into coding uh, during our live session today. 
applied. Applied, exactly. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is this is more or less let's say, the schedule. And since the first time we do it, let's see how long um, everything takes. I, I'm really curious to also learn a little bit about your backgrounds so that we can curate uh, both today's session and of course the coming sessions accordingly. Um, should, should we start with kind of just a little round yeah, robin yeah, yeah, of yeah, introducing yeah, yourselves? Maybe a little bit of where you're coming from? That would be great. I mean, if you guys can briefly unmute yourself, this is always a problem with Zoom on how to do the right order. But give us uh, your name, uh, say hello, and maybe a couple of sentences of your background. Um, what maybe brings you here, what, uh, what you're looking forward to in terms of the seminar. You want to start from here? Do you want to set up the order? We can just call it from. You want to call it? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so we're just going to do like, we just want to hear a brief introduction from, from each of you guys. Uh, so whoever wants to start, and uh, um, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. <laughs> if you want to just. Um, yeah, well, my name is Enda. Um, my background is in fine art and philosophy. I'm a certificate student. Uh, I guess at the moment, something that I'm quite interested in is the connection of like computation and formal languages uh, and the kind of epistemological problems surrounding that, that kind of uh, connection. Um, and I'm here because I was really interested in the fact that you guys want to take this into a practical dimension. Uh, I guess I have like, strong Marxist sort of leanings. And I, and I, I believe strongly in like, you know, being able to test things and like, uh, you know, uh, find, find knowledge through kind of, yeah, that level of engagement. So um, yeah, I'm really, really excited for the course. Uh, that's okay, all. Thank you. And what about Raphael? You're kind of next on the... Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Rafael. I am. Uh, my background is actually in international relations. Both my uh, my bachelor's and my master's, which I am about to finish. Uh, I am here mostly because I have been researching theories for the Anthropocene, specifically uh, thinking about the changes that uh, how some technical changes on the Anthropocene ch uh, bring new new diagrams for both governance and production. So this has been a, a main source of my interest. And uh, I think I decided to come here mainly because of the, um, of very similar to Enda's, Enda's justification actually, like mostly due to this uh, practical background that you guys are trying to bring. And also like the topics greatly interest me and specifically the Political, the political economy of all those changes and how they actually affect both the, the biosphere through certain sorts of metabolism and also how they create new relations of power and production. I think that's it. Thank also. you, welcome. And then next to you is uh, Zeno Bio. Hi, uh, my name is Zenobio. I'm from uh, Brazil too. As, uh, so it's uh, Rafael, and I'm finishing my bachelor in design and doing the, the, the post-planetary universal design program. And my, my background, my, actually my background is kind of uh, very short, but it's dealing, I, I, my, my research right now is dealing with uh, speculative design methodologies and how to, and how, how I, I mean that there, there's a lot of uh, speculative design and kind of uh, different approaches to speculative design, such as in, in Tony Rabi and, and, and Nishimi Brett and, and the, the decolonial uh, kind of uh, speculative design critiques. And I'm trying to, uh, to look at them through different lenses and to make a, a kind of uh, a more, yeah, methodological speculative design that could be not so uh, fantasizing about like a different stuff, but actually uh, do things to, to the future and, and stuff like that. Nice, thank you for sharing, welcome. And what about Vanda? Uh, next on the list. 
<laughs> That's funny because my name is not Vanda actually. So when ah. we, we joined the new the new room, so my girl's friend name showed up. I, the, the name was correct on the previous room. So I, I used her credit card. So now today I'm Vanda, but my name is actually, <laughs> uh, but my name is actually Diogo. Uh, I'm an artist and programmer uh, from Portugal. Uh, I also lecture on uh, computational languages. Uh, and since I've been working um, in the conjunctions and disjunction, uh, yes, disjunctions of different modalities of simulation in uh, computational practices, artistic practices, I thought that this seminar would be a, a more than appropriate starting point uh, here at the New Center. So this, this is also my first seminar. So yeah, that's it. Amazing. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> and uh, next to you is uh, Jenny. Denise Luna. Yes. Hi. Sorry, Hi. I, 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 I didn't hear my name because someone just came in and there was oh, a sound. Oh, Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. Uh, my name is Denise Luna. You can call me Luna. I am an architect, professor, and researcher from Mexico. I am interested in building theoretically and practically an architecture devoid of its commonly known references and associations uh, to construct possibilities of world making. Um, my, maybe through the exploration within the possibilities of diverse techniques um, and uh, analog or not analog um, through the thinking and practice at the planetary scale. So that's why I'm here. This is my first seminar in the new center. And yeah, I'm excited to get started. Amazing, thank you, welcome. And next to you, I see Tegan. Hi, I'm Tegan. Um, my background's in architecture and philosophy, and now I'm currently at the Bartlett studying situated practice, which is sort of critical theories um, and subjectivity's relationship to space and design. And so my research interest is really around machines augmentation to sort of space, nature, and ourselves and sort of advanced tech as prosthetics and sort of that realm of what we do with the digital tech and the sense. Wow, nice. Welcome. Uh, sure. Uh, I think next one in my list, Felipe. Uh, no, you're still muted, Felipe. Yeah, okay. Hey, uh, I'm uh, I'm Philippe. I'm from uh, from Lisbon, from Lisbon, Portugal, and I've been a musician and a draftsman for the last ten or twelve years. Now I'm uh, I have no academic background. I'm back uh, to studying, and I chose the New Center as a place to to restart. I enrolled in the certificate program for critical philosophy, and as of right now, I'm interested in developing a pedagogical program for. Uh, transcendental in humanism for the early infancy of either a machine or a young human. Uh, so anything post-planetary, Promethean and uh, universalist like this uh, seminar is quite, quite interesting. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. And then uh, Emma, Emma Stewart. Hi, I'm Emma. Uh, I'm finishing up my architecture undergrad. And for the most part, I'm just really curious in general. Um, I want to see like what coding can can accomplish and, and really learn more about that. So I'm, I'm still developing a lot of my ideas. Amazing. Welcome. Welcome. And Martina? Uh, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Martina. I'm Italian, but I'm um, based in London for a few years. I'm a researcher at the New Center as well as um, Goldsmiths University, where I'm um, completing a master's degree in contemporary art theory. Um, and I guess reason why I'm here enrolled within the course um, is um, related to the kind of research that I'm doing now, which is very loosely around uh, epistemologies and systems of thinking. And I'm doing a lot of work around theory making, modeling, and their kind of 
capacity to world build as well as uh, the relationship to fiction and ideology. So that's kind of where my interest lies with this seminar. Amazing, welcome. Um, sure, uh, Niv Vlahakis. Uh, Hi, um, I'm also a certificate student. This is my first class. Um, and I have a background in uh, neuroscience as well as um, like critical theory or psychosocial studies. My master's kind of dealt with um, how like theories of the mind and the unconscious like psychoanalysis are actually like historically rooted. Um, so yeah, taking um, ab abstracted theories and like grounding them in social, um, like the social realities of the time that they were created in. Um, and I've spent most of my time writing and also organizing spaces to like create uh, kind of focused on embodiment and um, exploring like the spectrum of embodiment and it kind of sort of led me to coding as like a possibility to uh, yeah for like create sort of new subjectivities and create new yeah, ways of being and like ways of relating um, in, a, in a, like a psycho uh, spiritual sort of way. So I'm, I'm really interested in how like digital technologies can like alter the like architecture of the mind. Um, and that's why I chose this uh, class as well because of like the um, application it has because I have been experimenting with, uh, yeah, uh, Python mainly. And yeah, I would like to do it in like a environment with other people. Amazing, amazing. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. And we have uh, Yip. Hi, Yes, uh, hello, uh, my name is Chun. Uh, Yip is actually my surname and Kai Chun is my given name. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, no worries. And uh, so I'm a, uh, hello from Hong Kong. Uh, I'm a visual artist and curator. Um, also new to this certificate program, uh, probably joining post-battery uh, universal design. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm in, generally interested in the notion of space, but more like uh, urban space and public space. And I somehow think this course may be actually related to this interest and may inspire me back to the physical space. I don't know. So uh, I'll figure it out. Yeah, I'm, in general, uh, I'm interested in the formation and organization of uh, community. So uh, I'll, I'll find out. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Mustafa? Hello, um, uh, my name is Mustafa. Uh, I'm an architect from Cairo, Egypt. Um, um, beside the office, the, the professional work, uh, uh, I was mainly interested in, um, uh, I was interested in um, e architecture and architectural design outside the confines of the normative modes of practice. And I, um, kind of developed a, a practice that mainly revolved around uh, software-based um, explorations uh, of form, and then use these explorations uh, in interactive and uh, immersive experiences. Um, I joined this uh, seminar and this program uh, in general because I'm um, interested in exploring different kinds of complexities uh, or complex systems other than complexities of form and um, and also explore different spatial and temporal scales for design uh, analysis and intervention. Amazing, welcome, welcome. Uh, and Polina? Hi, uh, my name is Polina. I was born in Russia, but now I live in New York and I come from a background in literature and data journalism. And in the past two years, I've been experimenting across different media and coding, um, mostly cr for creative practices. And, um, and I've been recently interested in, in algorithms that take inspiration from nature. And I would like to get some guidance in that very broad field and to develop my practice in them. Amazing, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and we have Eduardo. 
Sorry, we're catching yeah. up. Hi. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Eduardo Castillo Vinuesa. I'm currently zooming from Madrid, Spain. I'm an architect, but my practice is very transdisciplinary. I move across different disciplines, such as uh, curating, um, publishing, for example. I also teach at the Edson UPM in Madrid, at the Public University of Madrid, where currently I'm doing my PhD uh, around the social, technological, and ecological dimensions of planetary scale infrastructures. And I'm also a researcher of uh, the Terraform Initiative at the Stroke Institute in Moscow. Nice. Welcome. Wow. Welcome. Amazing. Um, and then Alex, I see Alex next to you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm a writer and a filmmaker based in Oakland, California. Um, my academic background is in architectural theory and history, as well as media studies, and I'm a certificate student at the New Center. Uh, I'm very interested in sort of the overarching themes of this course and how they might apply to my current research project, which is on World War II era facsimile architecture constructed by the US military in the American Southwest and how those um, embodied larger architectures of risk and doubt that emerged coextensively with financial capitalism. So um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the course. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and Donnie yes. is next to you. Hi, um, this is my first new center seminar and I'm here because a friend of mine reeled me into this course. And to be honest, I have no idea what half the words mean. So uh, I never even went to undergrad. I was just like, he's like, oh, here's a, a technical course might be like, uh, to interest you. So um, I'm founding a collective action startup, uh, essentially Kickstarter for new countries or networks, network states as Balaji Srinivasan describes them. So like, so countries on the, like in the cloud on the blockchain, and then maybe we can like move them in person physically. So maybe, maybe, maybe something which is this kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next one, uh, Hernan. Good morning. Yes. Hello. I'm Hernan Blumenthal. Um, I'm here in Buenos Aires, Argentina. This is my last seminar. Uh, I see a lot of new faces. Actually, this is a new program, so I guess most of you are new, but uh, this is a, 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 a beautiful institution, virtual institution. So um, on behalf of everybody, welcome. <laughs> um, and I was curious about uh, this, the, the, the course description. I'm actually, uh, my background is in um, biochemistry and molecular biology. And I'm heading into a research space more related to um, the predicted processing paradigm and uh, embodied cognition and how they can interact to overcome their limitations um, to account for sorts of um, yeah higher cognitive function basically so yeah that's me amazing thank you for the welcome to everyone all right um and alan yeah uh, hi uh, i'm alan i'm from mexico city I have a background in architecture, and media theory, and philosophy, but I've been quite distant from the whole architecture and design world for a while now. So this seminar, like, like uh, what other people said, like that the fact that it has like a practical aspect was uh, really appealing, and like bringing these two uh, fields together. And something I find particularly interesting that I would want to explore more is like how. Uh, these ideas about like fan computationalism can translate like into design and architecture. So yeah, amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And we have a couple more. I think maybe three more. Clarice Hill. Hello, I'm from Brooklyn. Um, I'm finishing up my PhD at Goldsmiths in the art research and computing departments. And in my research, I kind of like use virtual reality as a space of um, to kind of think about rewriting knowledge production as it happens in Western academic, um, in what, the Western Academy. And I'm here because like, this is kind of like what I'm thinking about as I kind of like finish my last chapter and move forward with um, submission is like, how can we use code and things that are already kind of like created in these 
um, privileged institutions in order to kind of like return to a pre-colonial site. So kind of like ideologies of pre-colonial site. So that's what I'm doing in my research. Okay. Well, thank mm -hmm. you. And uh, Nick Sani? Nick Sani. Nick Sani. Uh, hello. Oh, yeah, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm really sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually Ken Sani, like Barbie and Ken, and then Sunny Day. Um, yeah, Ken Sani. Um, I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, I'm an art curator and fine artist. Um, and what the reason I joined this is, I've been exploring uh, indigenous interfaces like like uh, divination systems, Dikenga of the Bantu Congo cosmogony, and I've been thinking about their applications in modern computing. Um, and I see this as like um, I think like as a launch pad for you know new ideas uh, towards um, redemptive futurologies in my particular locale. Um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Pleasure to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's so cool. Thanks for joining. Uh, I think the last person we have is Vincent. So we didn't introduce Vincent yet, right? No, no. So I'm a writer based in Manila, and my academic background is in language and literature. I'm also a certificate student here at the New Center, and my research project revolves around the concept of buoyancy and terminality as concepts crucial to a philosophy of post nature. Uh, what draws me in this course is an interest in what planetary scale complexity entails in designing coded intervention at present and what algorithmic tools of design could be distilled such that it remains attuned to our ongoing technologies and crisis. That's about it. Excellent. And I think, um, I, last but not least, I see also Sirpli uh, Lather, but I'm not, yes. Yeah. Hi, this is uh, Shilpi, uh, and my surname is Lathar. Uh, so I am a designer from India, and um, I basically work in the social impact sector. Uh, the current project that I'm working on uh, is based on changing mindset of young people that violence is normal, and where we are working both in the physical as well as the digital space. And um, what I found absolutely interesting about this course is that it's not just theoretical, but also practical application. So yeah, that's why I'm here. Amazing, thank you. So is, did we miss, did we- I hope anyone? we didn't miss anyone. anyone. Okay. Uh, this is, okay, okay, okay. Um, incredible diversity of not only backgrounds, but also um, let's say experiences, life experiences, academic experiences and so on. Um, Honestly, this is the most exciting part about this seminar. It's actually you guys in the sense that um, our kind of material, you know, has been, we've been working on this type of material for over 15 years, but never quite a, such an exciting and diverse um, field of participants in the sense of like coming from many different disciplines. Um, so that, that's what excites us the most actually about being here is exactly the different points of view and how we can um, that's some of these ideas that we typically, let's say, share with our uh, colleagues in architectural uh, academia and practice. Um, although we always love to talk about this type of work in a much more abstract and let's say almost um, theoretical uh, sense. So I'm um, also as anticipated to, uh, as you guys probably already guessed by hearing everyone else, we have a very diverse uh, field of, uh, let's say, expertise in terms of coding. And some of you guys, obviously, like, let's say that the focus of the seminar is not going to be just to get you, um, let's say, picked up or whatever. But definitely, as a lot of you mentioned, it's exactly a type of class that tries to test out these ideas and a particular, let's say, coded environment, right? Like to uh, not only um, write about uh, certain ideas, but in a sense, produce some um, artifacts uh, that come from your own personal engagement with this type of algorithm research. Um, I'm, um, do you want me to jump on the... Yeah, so we're, we'll, we'll just, we're gonna do a kind of a, a, a brief lecture to introduce the, the work we'll do within the course um, and also just um, kind of do a brief introduction to um, the first part, which is, you know, essentially um, introduction to 
coded worlds. Yes. Um, so maybe let, let's see. Let me start by quickly sharing my screen, and then um, and then we'll move into actually. You know what? Before a, we do this, yeah. yeah, 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 just to get you guys uh, kind of ready. So one of the things, uh, maybe as we're going through this lecture uh, that we prepared for you guys. Um, when we come back from the lecture, we're probably going to take a quick break. And after that, we're going to jump onto a super, uh, let's say as simple as it gets, kind of coding tutorial. Um, I want to, and the first coding tutorial that I was um, going to deliver to you guys uh, was going to be in Python and specifically for a software called Rhinoceros 3D and specifically Rhino and Grasshopper. That might sound Greek to some of you guys, right? So if it does sound Greek, don't worry. That's why we're here to introduce. Um, but in case you don't have this uh, software already installed in your computer, maybe I would recommend um, send you guys a quick link on the chat and you should be able to get a Rhino for Windows evaluation that will work uh, for 90 days as a free trial, no matter what, from this link. That can be downloading while we're... Yeah, it would be great if you guys can just quickly sure. download it uh, in the background. Awesome. Let us know, of course, if you have any problems, maybe, but uh, we'll, we can also have a little bit of time at the end um, if there are any installation issues. Actually, you know what? Hold on. I don't think I shared my audio, and maybe we want. Sorry for the multiple shares, guys. Starting one more time. So, computer sound. Okay. Was there was there any questions before we get started? So we'll do this uh, kind of brief lecture um, that kind of preferences uh, the uh, tutorial we'll do afterwards. Um, and then we'll kind of break off into a discussion. Um, unless otherwise explicitly stated, which I guess in the middle, in the middle of the lecture, we're going to show some um, some of our colleagues' work and even some of their uh, some of their texts or quoting. Otherwise, most of the work that you'll be uh, seeing in this uh, in this video and in this lecture is primarily our own student work from the last, let's say, 10, 15 years or something like that. I should also give you guys an idea, at least on the type of work that you would probably be uh, you know, expecting to um, see in the tutorials, but also the way that we like to think and talk about the work like this. I begin. Okay. Um, apologies for a little bit of a duplication. Of course, this is basically a larger expanded version of our syllabus, right? So maybe uh, some of the text will be put more into context. Um, so. Our world is increasingly being understood as an emergent outcome of complex systems. Similarly, both analytical and generative uh, tools for the definition of our spatial and architectural design systems um, have been well established uh, over the last few decades. Although this design approach is extremely sensitive to existing models of self-organization in material, biological, and physical systems, our intention could not be further than the mere replication of nor matter of course, not nature. On the contrary, with the deployment of nonlinear computational design methodologies, this seminar seeks new singularities in the extended territory of digital production. Algorithmic design research, uh, in our view, has the capacity to develop a deeper dialogue right, uh, in a variety of scales from the material and microscopic to the emergent and macroscopic. This research focuses on the inherent potential of computation to generate space and uh, the space of algorithmic procedures to engage in self-organization in the design process. Uh, these projects develop encoded processes through an aesthetic and intuitive and, um, and you, you could say an intuition in regards to um, complexity. Uh, these projects develop encoded processes um, that kind of reside and develop between um, design intent and emergent characteristics. The critical parameter is to explore the potential beyond the finite forms of explicit and parametrized um, modeling, rather towards uh, nonlinear algorithmic processes. The materialization of the research is nonlinear. The computational systems do not have a singular fabricated manifestation, nor do they have a predefined notion of its translation into architecture. 
Um, and maybe let me pause this thing a little bit because we're going a little bit too fast on this video. Um, as, as we kind of briefly mentioned in the syllabus, but it's an important, I guess, paragraph is our speculative condition, right, uh, we begin from is that computation is not solely digital, but it's omnipresent. And I'll expand a little bit on this uh, later. As such, uh, beyond the correlation of simulation, um, this seminar, this presentation, positions different mediums onto a flat ontology and mines the collateral effects and synchronicities between them. Um, meaning that we like to think about these systems on the most abstract um, sense in the one hand, but also um, that in, in a flat uh, type of application in multiple different domains. Um, what we seek in a way uh, is novel patterns of organization, structure and articulation, and those as design expressions within the emerging properties of, uh, that can be found in simple software, like feedback loops and rule systems. You wanna jump onto, yeah. We start from the void. Irrespectively, it is the space of all the two familiar Cartesian coordinates um, and, and can also be the multidimensional uh, system or uh, structure. Introduction of the internal features to it, I'll bet random or arbitrary spontaneously break its symmetry. The definitions of this features extend into the void by virtue of the consequences of its presence. The elementary geometry and its definitions of um, kind of featured is a point since it merely um, has its locations, but one can extend this geometric presence to any dimension. The, the geometric configuration of this feature is its scale, as well as its shape of space, its measurement, and um, it is also kind of inserted into different modes of its definition. We're talking about, let's say, the type of space that a point can be embedded into, right? Like the type of spatial arrangement, but also, uh, let's say, the the type of measurement that happens within that space uh, becomes a key number. This relative proximity or distance becomes a key feature to what follows. Um, let's consider this feature, this point as static for now. We can speculate a set of different affections as part of the definition of this asymmetry. Each affection creates a field around it and it's relative to a set of attributes. Let's say attraction or its negation, um, spin, wave emission, numerous other forces, physical forces, other forces as you can imagine, all relative in some way to distance. The introduction of feedback through additional attributes and behaviors increases the volatility of the system and leads to more intricate and complex order. Context sensitivity, steering and separation behaviors is just some of the examples of different agencies, different desires that one can attribute to these moving particles. The possibilities of invention are not only limited by the, uh, rather, I should say, the, the, the limitations, the possibilities of invention uh, are only limited by the author's imagination and the ability to break down these major properties into a population of local interactions instead of a direct top-down type of attitude. Um, and maybe to zoom out a little bit, um, computational creations of the types that you guys are looking at and specifically um, experiments in algorithmic design, one could claim require a new type of um, attitude, maybe even ethics towards the work. While designing a system in a field of results instead of a single entity, as we typically do in an architectural setting, it becomes a combinatory problematic on a meta level. Uh, which desires and processes are compatible to be codified together? How to orchestrate highly expressive face spaces uh, of, oppor uh, like of opportunities for formatting organization and so on. Which abstract logics of self-replication are capable of infinite amounts of difference? The success of this speculative and open-ended research is measured in the expressivity and plur pluralism um, of, uh, say, maybe, yeah, maybe I'll just mute this thing and we'll jump back into the music in a second. Um, I was talking about the success of this speculative research, yes, um, is, exp is really set as how expressive the face spaces of possibilities of your code 
uh, embodies and ultimately also its application into a real life scenario like an architectural uh, building or a designed object an, uh, an urban as uh, an urban system and so on the results fold into next projects both by the means of exhaustive catalogs and in the creation of multi-authored and open source computational libraries these languages in quotes as they escape the digital inscription to include other artifacts, sometimes notational and other times physical material, are always already multiple, collective and nonlinear because the process that produces them itself is in fact multi-authored, nonlinear. If we maintain that a set of qualities, uh, maybe I'll skip this little part here. No, no, it's, it's a good part. Um, I'm wondering here for a second if like there's a set of qualities that is feverishly uh, being codified over uh, the last few decades into algorithms. One could wonder what are the type of qualities that escape this inscription? Which part of the creative process resists objectification as mathematical or formal logic, as algorithmic notation? As a possible path to this approach, one could examine the qualities which are open to a subjective access Different interpretations of the notion of the subject there would uh, lead to analogous, uh, let's say, conclusions. Maybe a more anthropocentric narrative would locate the subject as the author or the visitor. It would celebrate the aesthetic and affectual properties of the work as primary territory uh, of resistance, of quantification. Um, an author that we might see in, also in our readings, Luciana Parisi, offers a different type of perspective. She claims that algorithms themselves are prehensions. This argument attempts to define computational aesthetics in a relative autonomy from the human subject. By extension, a third possible approach would define um, the creative process as a dialogue with a radical other. The ethics of participation in the conversation re require a constraint of the subject's projection onto the work, as if like you're you're operating on a system, you want the relative autonomy of that system and not superimpose one's will too much on that system. Um, and I'll expand a little bit on, on that last point um, from, a, from a quote from a good friend and um, mentor, in fact, Kao Chu, in a little bit, a little bit later in the, uh, in the lecture. Um, and maybe here I'll put a little bit of on this, uh, you know, just to make this a little bit informal as well, and taking a pause from uh, reading the lecture. This is an animation from a um, exhibition we sent uh, from Lighter Design about 10, 15 years ago. Maybe. It's, uh, it's quite old. Um, but we put it here precisely because it was one of the first experiments uh, that we did at a larger scale than, uh, let's say, an architectural type setting. This was an uh, algorithm wrote, uh, written for uh, the development of um, collective housing uh, on an island in Greece. And even though quite rigorously, mathematically, let's say, defined as a tiling system, its primary goal of that tiling system was fill the plane and space. In fact, sometimes the most important parts that come from your algorithm come as the failure of the algorithm itself, right? So like the most interesting part about that algorithm that you just saw was not the fact that it was in fact packing space or filling space, but it was somewhat able to capture, uh, let's say, uh, particular spatial conditions that you would find naturally in those um, environments in the South Mediterranean. And to continue a little bit more on the more informal note, um, we, we thought it would be a good idea to show you guys a some couple. of the applied. Yeah, some of the, some of the some of the more recent work, let's say, that we do in our office. Uh, this is from uh, Maeta Design, and got on to a couple of let's say real life projects. So that. Uh, yes. This, so th this particular algorithm that you're looking at here is um, testing really simple intersections uh, of different directions of lines. Um, this is basically like a really simple moire pattern, but uh, the, the way that it was codified, it was um, specifically for the fabrication of a metal facade uh, of a hotel in the center of Athens. Um, there we go. Yep. 
and that's and that's let's say the final facade um, fabricated and installed in the center of Athens. But also, it gives you guys an idea of the type of iteration and the type of uh, multiple kind of phase space that we like to work on, even if we're actually fabricating a very simple uh, single fabricated thing. Let's say some further details um, from that hotel, like interior. Um, Interior configurations, but also like furniture details. Um, there's a continuous freeze that effectively goes around the whole um, um, hotel. Oh, this one is great. Um, in 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 the section that I guess you saw a little bit briefly, uh, jumping on on your screen in front of the in the, inside the rooms. And this particular video, you probably recognize. Uh, what the original footage uh, behind um, behind our addition is. This is a short clip from the dream sequence in Blade Runner. Um, and it's been treated with the exact same algorithm we were using for the freeze inside the hotel, which I've shown you in the Project of Athens Lodge. Um, every single frame here is basically the artifact of uh, a computation. That is to say every single pixel is read and allowed to uh, interact with its neighbors through a um, simple, let's say, cellular automata algorithm that we will see uh, many examples of, uh, of which together. And this is a, a project that was shown at the Venice Biennale, um, and it looks at um, kind of an embedding. Here's a picture of the actual model. Um, embedding blockchain technology within an architectural brick. So each one of these was compu computing um, and, and running uh, a blockchain technology um, that was, you know, essentially like it was a contract to store um, data for a certain amount of time. Um, and, you know, they're discreetly uh, kind of fabricated and, and modulated. Um, and they were mixed with uh, kind of robotically fabricated um, hybrid materials. Um, so it's it's looking at like how do you recon how do you reconfigure or rethink of um, uh, building elements not only as uh, kind of understanding new types of material, but how do they blend themselves with um, electronics and something that would actually produce economy within an uh, within um, you know, among other things like Exactly, maybe, I mean, like th this project was a little bit of a accumulation of different threads of research that, uh, that we do in our practice. One has to do with robotic fabrication and let's say 3D printing with carbon fiber, um, but, but also a, a sustained interest in our practice in find, trying to find opportunities to embed or even Embody computation in the built environment, right? So, like uh, thinking of ways that computation is in fact already um, massively distributed, but one, how could one rethink the fundamental relationship between space and computation on a manifested level, right? Like uh, something that is typically fleeting and captured only in massive data centers. Um, but the idea would be that you could have distributed computation, and even uh, ideas about, let's say, unit of energy in relation to unit of uh, economy and ultimately the way that that defines a house environment. Um, and I think that leads us up to yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll expand a, a few more things here. I mean, the, the animation, the animation kind of follows uh, a proposal for a series of, uh, let's say, stacked um, microprocessors or a series of towers inside a large setting, like a forest. Um, the algorithms behind this, in fact, are relatively simple. We want to expand much further on this project, but I admit, but it's a it's a coded recursive process that builds the spatial configuration and then goes um, let's say various scales of uh, individual units or components that are allowed to interact with each other. Uh, part of the material behavior of the resin and of, of, the, of the cast uh, material is simulated in a virtual environment exactly to try to anticipate not only how the final product would look like or how it would feel, but also how it would behave over time 
um, through the production of heat or through the entropy uh, embedded through information. Uh, this is a brief animation of uh, showing different wiring between these components and presenting, let's say, the communication between these components. You want to skip? Okay, yeah, skip. Let's skip. <laughs> All right. So that takes us to kind of our, our kind of brief introductions to the origins of computation. Yes, I'm going to be looking at. Um, I'm going to be reading you guys actually through um, three to four authors, like short, short um, quotes or oh, short, somewhat short quotes uh, from uh, some of the writings while also showing you some of their uh, work. I mean, this is um, primarily for this, but I'm gonna start from a quote from Melanie Mitchell. Um, if you guys don't know Melanie Mitchell, you can, you can keep going. Um, Melanie Mitchell has definitely popularized, let's say, um, theories of complexity um, for the large crowds, does an excellent introduction into complexity and I'm reading from it. The goals of creating Artificial intelligence and artificial life can be traced back to the very beginnings of computer age. The earliest computer scientists, like Alan Turing, John van Neumann, uh, Robert Weiner, Weiner, and others, were motivated in large uh, part by visions of imbuing computer programs with intelligence, with a lifelike ability to self replicate, with the adaptive capacity to learn and to control their environments. Those early pioneers of computer science were as much interested in biology and psychology as they were in electronics. And they looked into natural systems as guiding metaphors for how to achieve their visions. It should be no surprise then that from the earliest days of computers, uh, were not applied, let's say the earliest days of computers were not applied only to calculating missile trajectories and deciphering military codes but also modeling the brain, mimicking human learning, and simulating biological evolution. These biologically motivated computer, uh, computing activities were waxed and wound over the years since, and since the early 1980s, they have all undergone a resurgence in the computation research community. The first was grown to the field of neural networks, the second into the field of machine learning, and the third into what is now called an evolutionary computation of which genetic algorithms are uh, the most prominent example. Mind you, also this text was written probably about like 10 years ago or something like that. And like even we've seen the resurgence, right, of like machine learning uh, again back in our, life, uh, in our current contemporary condition. And while looking at a series of examples of L system and substitution systems, I'm going to be reading a quote from uh, the father of fractals, uh, Benoit Mandelbrot. He, he writes, why is geometry often described as cold and dry? One reason lies in its inability to describe the, the shape of a cloud, a mountain, a coastline, or a tree. Clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, coastlines are not circles, and bark is not smooth, nor does lightning travel in a state line, in a straight line. More generally, I claim that many patterns of nature are so irregular and fragmented that compared with Euclid nature um, exhibits only a higher degree, not only a higher degree, but an altogether different level of complexity. The number of dis distinct scales of length of natural patterns is for all practical purposes infinite. The existence of those patterns challenges us to study those forms that Euclid leaves behind as being, being merely formless and to investigate the morphology of the amorphous. Mathematicians have disdained this challenge, however, and are increasingly chosen to flee from nature by devising theories unrelated to anything that we see or feel. Um, quickly skip a little bit of this. We saw a lot of fractals and some more fractals. Um, and while I'm showing you uh, in the video here, uh, some of the work of um, Cecil Balmont, um, specifically, this is a, a pavilion uh, in collaboration between Cecil Balmont and Toyo Ito. Um, 
but I'll be going through a little bit of some of Cecil's work, um, long time friend and collaborator. Cecil writes in his book Informal, in the introduction uh, for his book Informal, a critical book that came out around 2002, made a huge impact in our discipline. He writes, but in a building form that is static, where are the dynamics? What is the non-linearity? This is a difficult question. To my mind, the answers die, lie deep in configuration. As we are made of patterns, both random and regular, both physical and emotional, probing the archetypes of pattern is important. In its, in its recognition and resonance, we might find an element of beauty. In the past, beauty was condi uh, conditioned by aspects of purity, fixed symmetries and paired minimal structure as being accepted uh, as the norm. As long as our brains kept to, to these trend lines of reasoning, the model persisted. Now that the word is being accepted not as simple, the complex and the oblique and the intertwining of logic gain favor. Reason itself is finally being understood as nascent structure, nonlinear and dependent on feedback procedures. Beauty may lie in the actual processes of engagement and be more abstract than the aesthetic of objecthood. Ultimately, it may really be a constructive process. And a few more sentences, he continues uh, immediately after this. Uh, Cecil writes, we are in a time when anything goes and there is no basis for a manifesto. Postmodern has come to, ultimately, no meaning. 2002. With little understanding of the motivation of form, modernism runs into minimalist dead ends. And by continuing to look to the outside, um, the seduction with objecthood and architecture as art persisted, perpetuated. Geometry is not invoked. No one peers with, within and asks questions about the archetypes of form. These are forgotten. Instead, instant realizations are sought from computers with form finding that is software dependent. Um, yeah, and I'm um, continuing on a little bit on this thread, um, kind of from Melanie Mitchell to Cecil Barman. And now a short quote from Kao Chu, which is uh, one of the readings actually we're gonna share with you guys to, um, let's say to revisit together for next week. Culture writes in his uh, paper, The Metaphysics of Genetic Architecture, um, quote, this discovery of the inextricable linkage that exists between computation and physics has led to the awareness that physical processes are in fact forms of computation. And nowhere is this understanding made more explicit than in Stephen Wolfram's formulation of the principle of computation, computational equivalence. Stephen Wolfram remarks, quote, all processes, whether they are produced by human effort or, um, you can keep playing, um, sorry, yes. Uh, Wolfram remarks, all processes, whether they are produced by human effort or occur spontaneously in nature can be viewed as computation. And a little bit later in the article, Kao Chuk, um, remarks, yet what is the nature of computation that is destined to change the world, including architecture? No instrumental concept or logic of the implementation since the invention of the wheel has fostered so much, so much enthusiasm and promise as computation has. Beyond the normative conception of computing machines as the mere instruments of calculation, publication, and communication, it is important to recognize that the nature of the underlying ambitions of computation um, and its relation to architecture. In this case, of course, Carl talks about architecture as world making. As controversial and provocative as it may seem, the underlying ambitions of computation are already apparent. The embodiment of artificial life and intelligent systems, either through abstract machines or through biomechanic mutation of organic and inorganic substances, and most significantly, 
the subsequent sublimation of physical and actual words into higher forms of organic intelligence by extending into the computable domain of possible words. Sorry, this is a little bit more uh, longer quote by Carl, but um, um, he continues. It is not surprising that the origin of computation lies in an attempt to embody instrumental reason in an abstract machine, along with the attendant drive to encode the logic of life and the world around us in all of its manifestation. The quest for a universal language which could encapsulate all the attributes and functions necessary to inscribe the form and structure of all computable words is becoming one of the most persistent endeavors in the short history of computation. Last paragraph from Carl. Architects, take note. This is the beginning of the demise, if not the displacement of the reign of anthropology, which has always subsumed architecture. Architecture, especially from the standpoint of its mythical inception, has always been a subset of anthropology. The expulsion of the, the minotaur, the beast, by entrapping it into the labyrinth by Daedalus, the mythical architect of Knossos. The potential emancipation of architecture from anthropology is already affording us to think for the first time of a new kind of Xeno architecture, which with its own autonomy and will to being. In order to break through the barrier of complacency and self-imposed ignorance on the part of the discipline, what is needed is radicalization of the prevailing paradigm of architecture beyond retroactive manifestos by developing a new concept of architecture that is adequate to the demands imposed by computation and the biogenetic revolution. End quote by Paul. Um, I have to say this has, I mean, this not only uh, it's a really dear text to, to both of us, but this has also been, let's say, a ghost in our thinking all the way, uh, traces this back to the days I was a student actually in grad school. Um, and in the in the background, you guys have been looking at uh, some of the work by Michael Hansmeier, um, a dear colleague um, that also comes from the same type of, let's say, conceptual background and, uh, ideological underpinnings together with culture and the definition of architecture as a discipline that endeavors into the creation of possible words instead of um, designing mere buildings. Um, and maybe just to fast forward a little bit, Philippe. Um, so last, um, last quote, within this part of the presentation is by um, Philippe Morel in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of his articles called Computational Revolution. Um, Philippe Morel is the um, uh, principal of EZCT, uh, an architecture design research firm. Uh, Philippe writes, the integration of concepts like the distributed partial machine intelligence within the design process is an integral component of ECCT architecture and design research work. However, the practice not only refers to ideas of technology and science in their analysis of technology, but makes use of them. Architects should not only metaphorically depict technology, but they should use it in the flat model beyond any representation. Finally, because EZCT is part of the multitudes whose work concerns the ultimate production of human imagination, that is concepts, the practice also builds proofs for these concepts as design projects constructed through computers and programming languages. And a few more words by Philippe. Um, he writes, there could be unthinkable thoughts and there could be an unthinkable architecture. Therefore, the task of any architect is not, to, is not about using computers to replicate or to automatize what has already been thought and produced but it's about allowing computers to reveal a fully new form of architectural intelligence that we humans are unable to fully um, uh, conceive. It is useless to make use of machines that operate at a teraflop speed for the replications of what humans can compute at the rate of 10 to two or something like that. Machines that operate thousands of times faster than humans, therefore in the regions of computational speed far beyond the capacities of humans, should logically give birth to a kind of architecture that is only also beyond 
our usual capacities. Such an architecture is still to be produced. End quote. Breather. Um, your, um, your, um, shared with you a couple of projects by Philippe Morel. One was uh, just a moment ago, um, a computational chair, uh, one that looked into structural, uh, let's say evaluation of a cellular setup, um, as you saw before, and a very similar type of algorithm, a very similar type of project. In this case, um, a genetic algorithm that is looking for uh, carving, rather to be quite literal, carving a block of white matter, right? Um, through different sun angles for optimal, uh, let's say, sun conditions within. Um, uh, this project was a combination of a residency together with an art gallery uh, just outside of Paris for a competition. Let me just fast forward to this a bit. You see here the sun angles and some quick renderings of the final result. Um, okay. Um, jumping back onto some of our own, uh, let's say, design work, and uh, it's specifically, this is some of our students' work in the last few years, student, student research. Um, Exactly. In the context, uh, the, most of these projects that you will see in this part of the lecture uh, are from uh, the studios that I got with Cecil Bauman at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Um, and a little bit of a background in regards to uh, cellular automata systems, which is basically the type of algorithms that you guys are watching right now. Through numerous projects, the underlying generative principle is a manifestation of primitive reason in the form of elementary rule-based systems. A variety of different mathematical precedents can be grouped together here um, in the category as substitution systems. Prior to their geometrical manifestation, these computational systems are nothing other than just matrices of data. The notion of time in these systems is of prime importance here. What notions or meanings of time do we project onto these systems when we count the recursive amount of iterations? How do we reconcile with the fact that like even the appearance of simple movement or growth is nothing but an epiphenomenon of state transformations, right? Nothing moves in what you're looking at here. Like pixels are basically just turning on and off, literally. One of the most important questions though arises when one examines not only as a, a cross section of iterations, but rather a cross section of rule sets. And in, um, in his influential paper, Universality and Complexity in Cellular Automata, I'm going to go back and quote um, Stephen Wolfram, proposed a classification of cellular automata rules into four types. It's a fundamental classification, really well known. Um, according to the results of, evolved, of evolving a system from a disordered initial state. So we, be, we begin with a random state and we apply the rules over and over again, then we look at the result and we contemplate on the result. Has evolution led to a homogeneous state? Uh, has it led to a stable or periodic structures? Has it led to a chaotic, completely un, um, undecipherable organization or pattern? Or has it uh, developed complex localized structures? This classification was initially only meant for elementary one-dimensional uh, cellular automata. Uh, Stephen Wolfram almost provides a proof for this kind of classification. But from our view, it can be generalized to all systems with low-level rules and meta-level results. Um, main distinction in here is their ability in the production of difference overall difference, like how much difference can a rule set produce. Um, the fact that we can categorize rules based on their predestined, let's say, emergent character, the, mo the modalities of localized time as organizational variants, right, that they produce. I'm still trying to describe what, what, is, what is difference here. Um, the study of geometric manifestation of substitution systems, as well as their spatial unfolding, can be as rich as the study in the rules themselves. And simple stacking of iterations, although simplistic, may have a strategic advantage precisely because it operates as a cross-section of time. 
and reveals patterns through causal relationships, right? Do you understand how one layer is able to produce the next one? You like you understand this intuitively as an aesthetic condition also. A more complex approach to the question of mapping um, might be to allow for a more complex spatial configuration and allow for further generations to change their own past or to um, anticipate their own future. Um, as such, a little fold into the plane of cellular automata, right, might allow for this type of interaction. Various projects in uh, these courses uh, have attempted the fractal approach into mapping, right? And of course, mapping will be a, a, a large uh, part of our discussions and how mapping affects, um, uh, let's say, reading, but also the structure of information itself. Um, and I guess what I'm, uh, I'm going to transition a little bit also to give you guys an idea, even though we start from very abstract and general rule sets, ultimately some of these projects um, in, the, in their context had to produce a specific design result. This particular project we're looking at <clears throat> was developed for an urban design proposal um, at the site of Elinikon, uh, X airport, gigantic site in uh, the periphery of Athens, similar with this project. And, um, I guess the one thing that I wanted to mention briefly before we jump onto the next one uh, about this project is that the site here, <clears throat> sorry, in its current state of abandonment and decay, um, as it unfortunately still is today, uh, is usually referred to as one of the largest urban voids worldwide. Um, a more appropriately say conceptual tool for both of our analytical and generative potential in this particular case was the idea of a palimpsest. The nonlinear traces of geological, cultural and economic and even social forces define a fragmented and inconsistent landscape. In a similar way to the various projected futures of the site, right? Ma manifest um, and con constrain transit debates. The studio researched and generated a multidimensional terrain of data, which attempted to capture and uh, compress, let's say, the various past and futures of the site. This abstract, let's say, data set, this construction was our conceptual and literal site of intervention. Um, and like, let's say, design from our students um, uh, operated as a feedback tool for navigation and adaptation to this, uh, let's say, data landscape. And I believe that immediately the next year we were looking into another site, uh, in this case in the center of Athens. I'm going to be showing you one or uh, two or three projects, in fact, I think, uh, from our student project from that studio. Um, and the, the site itself, uh, being in the center of Athens, up on the hill of Lycabetus, having a 18th century old uh, aqueduct um, that still brings water onto this public plaza to the day. Um, I guess I'm gonna, it, it, this was a project that was in a collaboration with the Athens um, Water Supply Company and our studio investigated, as I mentioned, the Examinee Square, which is the name of the square, as a complex urban public space in the center of Athens. Um, the site had a deep history, both with geological, infrastructural and material uh, and cultural layers. It includes uh, archaeological ruins of the of a Hadrian aqueduct, multiple water tanks with rich architectural elements, an open air theater, cafes, and other open spaces. Um, from our view, this complex space acted as a kind of nymphaeum, as a setting and a distribution basin. Um, the larger network expanded for 25 kilometers. So, like you have to imagine, there's a spine of water that runs all throughout Athens and ultimately brings, collects water from the whole basin um, and delivers it to, uh, to this square. It was built in year 120 by a Roman emperor, Hadrian. The project was the design of a museum and an art installation, and it concerned the relation between art, architecture, formation, and sculpture. We proposed a hybrid program between a public plaza, an open air theater, and a museum gallery. Right. Um, and I want to change a little bit the tone and uh, read you a really influential quote by Lebius Woods um, by his, from his project Underground Berlin. Um, that's okay, we're almost done. Um, Lebius Woods 
writes in Underground Berlin. Experience is expressed when expression is required at all by number and by matrices of numbers. The frequencies of harmonic and disharmonic vibrations at every level of the organization of matter and energy, at every level of the materiality of both that which is experienced and that which experiences from atoms and molecules to cloth walls and apparatuses, to planets, galaxies, and the cosmos. All is number and all is frequency, vibration. All is unified in the experience of number and its record is self, is, sorry, its record is left in the precise but unpredictable mathematics of form. But number includes all we can call geometry. Although the inhabitants of the underground city would prefer the term metricality, meaning measure in its purest form. Metricality is the mathematics of the dynamic kinetic quality of both time and space unified in the idea of um, space and time as the continuous fabric of things uh, kinetic and in some way living. In the living laboratories are machines that play or are played to take a kind of quantum mechanical music. For music too is number, geometry, metricality. The sound of this music would indeed be strange to us because none of us have ever heard it. For it is once heard and thought and felt. It is a vibration of the free oscillating earth and of the atoms comprising it. This music is a vibration of neutrinos as they pass through the earth from their origins deep in space and time. I think I should leave it here. Maybe, yeah. Um. Okay, so that was our kind of brief introduction uh, to what we'll be going through today, a little bit of our work and also just positioning uh, the conversation um, around the origins of, of, of computation in, in our own work, but also kind of in the, the speculative work we, we, we hope to do with you guys. All right. I mean, first of all, I mean, obviously, let's open it up to any questions, remarks, uh, re reactions even. Um, well, it's a large crowd, but... And then... <laughs> <laughs> nice. Can I ask a question? Please. Sure. Um, yeah, I was really in, so I, I did have a quick look at the um, the the uh, Chu paper before the class, and I, one thing that I that you quoted that I was quite interested in, but it was also like a provocation was maybe that there's a degree of ontologization of uh, computation in a sense where he is saying. Um, you know, there's a, uh, there's a kind of direct correspondence between physical processes and computation. Um, and I wasn't sure if I fully, uh, like, took on board the justification for this, or, you know, I feel like it wasn't maybe fully spelled out. And of course, you know, maybe that's just within the constraints of the paper, not possible. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, one thing that I'm, I'm I feel really wary of, despite the fact that I really enjoyed everything uh, that was in the paper and the, the general thesis, and also of your presentation, which I really enjoyed as well. Is you know um, the worry that at a certain point the effective quality of uh, drawing kind of like um, uh, like um, similarities or similar observations between physical laws and computation and formal languages can be a kind of uh, uh, like a gateway towards um, uh, maybe it's like a, a kind of hubris that I'm like feeling wary of or you know it bypasses the epistemological question of like how do these formal languages actually access the the real that we're trying to talk about when we talk about the practical um, uh, relation of computation to the world so um, I was just wondering whether you guys had any thoughts on that, and obviously it's a big question, so I don't, uh, you know, I think it's that's an excellent question. But that's like, let's say, I mean, thank you for the remark. In fact, it's not just a question. It's, uh, um, in fact, hopefully, we can have exactly the type of space to discuss 
these type of questions in regards to the work that we typically don't get to discuss in other in other settings. Um, I mean, it's interesting it's, you, you bring this up immediately, and then like, let's say, I, I believe you're talking about call, right? Uh, but ultimately, I think one can trace this back to Stephen Wolfram, right? Uh, and his introduction into the new kind of science. And of course, that introduction makes certain physicists really angry, right? Because the dichotomy there is, does the universe allow for computation to exist, right? Or if you look at this thing from a, from a uh, so it depends also which epistemology you're subscribed to, but like the, the point is the Wolfram would ultimately argue and I don't think that there is, personally, I don't think that there is a, necessarily a proof behind this, but um, Wolfram would argue that uh, the universe exists because it's computable, not the other way around. Like, let's say physical laws, right, are the emergent properties from uh, computational processes, rather than the other way around, as you would, um, let's say, think about this from a normal physicist point of view. Um, but of course, there are arguments on both accounts. Um, and we're getting, yes, exactly, Pasquinelli's reference on the, on the chat by Raphael. Um, lovely text, really love that text. It's an excellent reference. Mm -hmm. And also much more recent in terms of Pasquinelli's look into, uh, let's say our current fascination with machine learning from that text. Um, I don't know, actually, does anyone else want to expand on this? I mean, um, I, I wonder if Carl, Carl's main argument, I think he, Carl too relies on Stephen Wolfram to, let's say, bypass that problem. But I think that at the core of the problem is a philosophical question that actually has to do with Platonism ultimately, and like the, the question of um, ideals as a formal um, pre-existing notion or formal language as a human invention, right? Um, Obviously, I guess I would say, I'd like, I think just, I'm going to start speaking for myself rather than for the group, right? Um, but the, my personal fascination with code and with uh, formal language in general that traces back all the way from my undergraduate studies um, was exactly kind of a vector of trying to both un understand my own kind of creative process, but ultimately try to restrain um, this into a set of rules in thinking about what is the relative degree of, of autonomy of a system? Um, and that's obviously a very soft answer to your question, right? Um, but uh, I, would, I would argue that uh, in, a, in trying to imbue relative autonomy to, uh, to a particular computational system and study it for its own right before it has a specific manifestation, at least begins to address this question of uh, formal language, irrespective of what came first. That's a very good question. I'll try to answer that on the fly, so. Um, anyone else wants to jump in? Chating is great on this too, indeed. I, and in I, fact, I, I'm surprised that we haven't actually, I haven't brought up Godo here, right? But like Godo would, would be at the center also. Uh, in his incompleteness theorem about formal language would be at the center of this type of debate. I wonder about the, the, the problem of the, the agency in these complex system studies, because it's usually kind of, uh, I see as a romanticization of randomness and they don't actually uh, uh, ping the, 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 the problem of agency. Where, where, where is the agency in the complex systems? Because this is usually, yeah, you know, like there are a lot of uh, ants, army ants and stuff like that, that they, they kind of uh, acts like random, but it's organized. And is usually seeing random uh, organization uh, through randomness without agency. And I, 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 I'm wondering about the, what, what you guys can, can talk about. Another excellent question. I mean, this is, this is awesome. Um, I think uh, you're touching upon one of the key 
things that we will have a chance of actually discussing this even more, right? As we jump onto, let's say, more practical applications of this. But um, there hasn't been a single, let's say, seminar, right? That we uh, that we kind of touch upon this type of work that um, doesn't immediately have to address the question of randomness. Um, I mean, Chaitin, and not only Chaitin, but like the there's a few mathematicians that. Um, that I can recommend in relation to readings about complexity and randomness and also different definitions of randomness. But just to make it simple and to make it clear, um, I would probably argue uh, for a couple of things. First of all, we can, the, the question of randomness, once you open it, honestly, it can go on for the rest of the seminar if you want, right? Like I think it's sincere, sincere. Like where do you even find proper randomness, especially in a deterministic machine in front of us uh, from your computer. Um, Stephen Wolfram, in fact, uses some of his rules to develop random numbers. And I mean, since they are from rules, you could say, you could argue they're nothing but uh, the, uh, random. Um, but what you're bringing up is more important than the definition of randomness. And the question there, I think for me is, what is the, what is the difference and let's say what is the difference that makes the difference between a complex behavior and a random behavior um, and I think that this has primarily to do with the level of communication or connectivity that, it, that between two systems maybe one of application and when it may be one of uh, that has an underlying let's say desire or something like that I'm obviously making it way more general but if, let's say, to make a simple example, if you have two systems, you superimpose them to each other, uh, it's easy to get something that appears complicated or something that appears to have a relative degree of randomness without looking too far into what random means in that sentence. But nevertheless, it might be easy to do that. What is actually hard is to allow for a certain um, interaction between elements and to develop a complex order which is nothing like random, in fact. If you can recognize that there are specific orders of um, organization, uh, and in fact, multiple different complex orders of organization. I mean, I, want, I, would, like to I would like to think, right, that um, that resonates with you in some of the videos that we were showing you, uh, even if you don't know exactly the type of rule or code that was presented, in that I'm hoping that of course, not all, but maybe let's say 90% of the, uh, the examples we're showing you in those videos are examples of nested scales of, uh, uh, of behavior, right? And ultimately that behavior is easier to lead to a simple or a complex structure rather than uh, ultimately to randomness. Um, but the question of agency that was kind of, of course, affiliated with the question of randomness and um, let's say complexity. I think we might, be, well, we're going to have a series of presentations also in the coming weeks. Uh, we were hoping to actually look more into uh, the question of uh, agency in relation to our second tutorial next week. Um, in, in that, let's say this week we start from general rules that apply to a whole game board, right? Before you can actually put actors, let's say, on this game board. And, uh, and give them rules on how to navigate it. That's, let's say, the general vector of the seminar. Amazing question, guys. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so it's 12. Thank you. 12 yeah, no, somebody else. Yeah. Do you want to give everyone 10 minutes and or five minutes and jump onto this? Thing? Actually, let me ask you guys a, a logistical question uh, because in the way that we want to treat tutorials, uh, not only for today, but also for the weeks to come. Um, we want to, in the coming weeks, you guys will also have some work and we want to have enough time to discuss your work and have a, a, an exchange primarily while we meet live on Zoom, right? Um, uh, today, we're going to spend at least the remaining part of the time into a live tutorial, but also I should let you guys know we have dozens and dozens of pre recorded videos of, let's say, more technical um, uh, part, right? Like how to learn coding if you've never coded anything before, yeah. right? And of, also, obviously, all of these sessions are recorded and we can, uh, we can share with you during the week 
um, emails and you can follow tutorials on the site if you want to catch up and so on. Uh, anyway, we are going to take it as fast or as slow as the class goes and we have a ton of resources that can uh, that can complement this type of um, coding engagement, let's say. All right, so I think what we'll do, should we send them the links to the to the Yes. Links? So we're going to send you the links to our Google Drive, but also um, the, base, the base files. Well, why don't you just send the tutorial files? Right tutorial now. files folder. So if you guys want to download. Um, Actually, this. hold on, before, I'll, I'll share my screen. I'll let you guys know. So this is, this is a folder in our Google Drive shared with the rest of the class here. Um, it already has one folder for today's tutorial um, coding. in coding. And we're going to be populating this folder with uh, more technical files as we go along. Now, let me show you guys a little bit the structure of this. So inside tutorial files, like I've just went into uh, part one, day one, and into coding. Um, let's see. I have um, I have uploaded a ton of stuff here already. Which so like all of these files that you see here are both literally word by word notes of the tutorial, the Python script that is literally this is very introductory. So like it's just a few lines of code. In every um, in every one of these files, right, kind of numbered one through nine, and I also uh, have uploaded basically a video if you want to revisit uh, and see, right, like that particular section of the tutorial. Um, and the file that I was planning to share with you today, I think that's what I should spend most of my time in. Um, it's inside yet another folder called Labyrinth, right. So I'm going to have. You might not be sharing your screen. No, I am. So I, you guys can see my Rhino, no? Yep. Sweet. So I'll be hopefully in the remaining time, um, starting from, let's say, hello world, and then show you a few uh, different, um, uh, let's say, interface things. Um, sharing with you guys the file, uh, this grasshopper file, and explaining the logic on how this thing works, um, and picking it up from there. Before we do so, did any, does everyone have Rhino and or did you guys have any problems installing? We're all good. Good to go. Good to go. Okay. Um, for those of you, oh, chat, chat. There is a there is a secondary conversation happening in the chat. If you guys need something from me, I think it's already resolved. Um, just a few interface things because some of you may have never used the CAD software for that matter, right? Like um, I know um, it's one of the most popular uh, CAD software uh, environments, not only within our discipline, but for all sorts of designers from product design all the way to urbanism, arguably. Um, what I have shared with you guys is basically a simple logic that produces a labyrinth. Um, and probably by the time you open the file, something like that might show up. Or if uh, here on the right-hand side uh, of my interface, I have um, a little inter well, I have a series of windows that you can undock and dock. Um, if you guys, for some reason, you're missing this little interface, uh, you can bring it up by clicking these two buttons on your screen. One is for layers. It looks like a, like and a one, layer cake. Layer cake, French layer cake for some <laughs> reason, kind of, maybe not French. Um, and right next to it is the properties. So like I would definitely have these kind of two tabs open in my interface all the time. Um, this software is uh, super famous, not only because it has like an, an, you know, great ability to make all sorts of three-dimensional forms, but it has become one of the industry standards for, uh, let's say, algorithmic and computational design um, through two things. One, 
if you guys type, actually, I should say, all the way up here is the command line. Um, here is where you type simple commands in Rhino to perform specific tasks. Like you, let's say you want to create a polyline, you want to type polyline, right? Or you want to draw a curve. And then you start basically giving input to Rhino inside the three-dimensional space. Um, a few more things about the interface is if you double click on the name of the view, which is up here on the left-hand side, that will toggle between four different views, perspective, top, um, front and right. And uh, you double click on it again, you maximize one of those, one of those views. Um, how much else should I say about that? I, know? I mean, I think. I think that might cover it. Actually, no. How do you move around? Huh. Mouse, primarily left, uh, sorry, <laughs> right uh, mouse button. Let's start with the right mouse button and, and click and drag onto the viewport will allow you to basically rotate around uh, the camera. Holding down shift on your keyboard and using the, again, the right mouse button allows you to pan and the scroll of the mouse or control. So again, right mouse button always, right? And that rotates. Shift right mouse button, pans. Control right mouse button zooms in and out, but that you can also do with the scroll. Um, now, if this is literally the first time you, you open Rhino, one of the really important commands that you will find um, quite useful is uh, how does it know, how does Rhino know where to center and what to look around? Um, one of the commands that I type 200 times a day is I click on something, I select it, and by selecting it, you see it becoming yellow and highlighted. So once I have something highlighted, I type Z for zoom, S for selected, enter. So ZS enter zooms your view to what you have selected, but more importantly, centers the point of rotation right of the camera so you are focusing on a specific object or uh, what, what specific model or that is. all right that was a little bit fast but um, i have no idea what is your general background right in terms of cad so i hope this was a little bit enough to navigate this software any questions so far good it seems like a couple of people aren't able to download um, the software because they have older computers. Do you have any suggestions? Um, I might need the computer specs. I definitely have suggestions. I mean, you can. It's older. There is an older version of Rhino, which for our purposes, I don't think is going to produce any problem. Um, but the question is, do they have an evaluation version? Uh, they don't, I checked. Yeah, a legacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm not sure, guys. I will need to check. Um, Maybe send, if you could send the specs, that's you can do a little research on yeah. how to get that software to you. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, Look, to, to be fair, uh, we use Rhino because we use Rhino every day for other purposes. It's a great environment to begin coding because it already has an interface, like you can move things, you can make things by hand and kind of interact with them through code instead of a purely coding environment and open source, like for example, processing or something like this. That's why we chose this and also because it's Python. Um, but to be fair, ultimately, most of the logics uh, that we'll be using are not software dependent, right? In fact, we'll be writing our own software for our yeah. So it's not that you know you need Rhino in order to be successful in this seminar. It's just that we'll try to base our tutorials on Rhino. And in fact, uh, a little bit Unity, we'll try to use different software environments uh, to introduce you guys to a bunch of stuff. Um, is there another comment? No, thank you. Um, let me start, before we jump onto Grasshopper, um, let me start with the, we're only gonna use a couple of commands in the Rhino command line today. The first one 
It's going to be edit Python script. Yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, edit Python script. You can type that in the command line up here and you hit enter. It's going to pop up this like uh, text editing um, kind of software native. Yeah, we'll open up this little interface that allows you to write code in it. Mm. Oh, nice. Random four. Damn. <laughs> that is like. Very cool. Thank you. Thank That's you. Awesome. It really helps things. Um, interestingly enough, I don't remember if Rhino 4 has Python, but we'll see. Um, anyway, wow. um, like we will up in the command line itself today, we might use like three commands, not more than that. So let's start with edit Python script that opens up a generic, let's say, editor, coding editor that is already embedded into Rhino, right? So this is Rhino's scripting environment. Um, the interface that you see here is pretty simple. Um, it's broken down, let's say, into three parts. Uh, on the white part right here is where we're going to be typing our code. And you can change the scale. I'm going to be zooming in in order to make the font a little bigger by holding down Control on your keyboard and with the scroll of the mouse, right? So Control and scroll, you can change the size of the font display. Uh, and one of the things to keep in mind about code to begin with let's say hello. Something like this. Um, you probably, as you saw, <laughs> um, Every coding tutorial starts with something like this, right? Um, you say, hello world. Um, you saw that as I was typing, right? The coding editor uh, started recognizing some of the th things that I typed um, and started basically color, color coding them accordingly. Um, this is some of the kind of the elegance of Python as a language, you don't have to call out necessarily your your different um, variable types. Yeah, well, this, will, this will come in a second. Recognizes it already. <laughs> exactly. The, uh, the one thing to keep in mind about code just before we even begin, or coding editor before I talk about code, um, the coding editor is nothing fundamentally different from your notepad. Uh, in fact, it's closer to your notepad than it is to your word processor, right? So. The one thing to strip down in your thinking as you're looking at this text inscription is that the formatting of this text, right, is absent. Like there is no other information other than the characters that I'm typing here, right? I hope that makes sense. Like there's no extra formatting that has to do with the base, place on the page or the way that this thing is laid out on a screen or on a piece of paper or anything else. What we see literally these characters is the whole information. Okay, um, let's quickly run our first little code here. I'm just gonna hit play, uh, play button up here. A couple of things uh, happen. The first thing that happens is we have established a, um, we have established that we have connection between the environment in which we're typing the code and the environment in which we're running the code. Um, so the little message that I left inside quotes uh, to be printed was reproduced inside the Rhino command line and was also reproduced on the bottom half of my coding editor under the tab output. Right? So typically when we refer to um, the output in scripting, um, we're basically referring to the area in which the computer is going to print a bunch of statements. Those statements either come because you asked them to be printed as a programmer or the computer is returning to you with some information in regards to a bug an error, um, some other information from its memory. That's how you communicate with it. Exactly. Um, now, apologies for those of you who haven't done a little bit of coding before. You, uh, If you have, I'm sure you realize why it's important to do a really good introduction into the fundamental ideas about coding. Primarily, the fundamental ideas about coding produce the most confusion as we go forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you're looking at this, 
if this is literally the first time you ever coded, one of my main goals here is to try to separate in your eyes how code is in relation to text, English for that matter, or even mathematics, right? Like so certain symbols that we use in coding every every day, all the time, in fact, have slightly different meanings than you would expect from typical English or math. So for example, um, just straight out, let's type um, a message. Um, I'm just making four basic variables. Um, No idea. Thirty one currently. Four fundamental and basic types of uh, variables, and in fact, this will also give me the opportunity to discuss like a variable. A variable in computation in scripting um, is not exactly as you would expect it from the general notion of something that varies in English or even something as a variable in a function uh, in mathematics, right? So like a variable in computation is simply defined as a place, literally a physical in fact almost, uh, address in the memory of your computer in which you can store information, right? That of course might mean that that, uh, that entity, that variable, has the ability to vary over time as you code it. But more importantly, don't think of it as something that you look for, right? Or something that is like unknown or anything. It's something completely demystified. Here's, here's a piece of information, right? Python introduction, inside quotes. And that piece of information is going to get stored in my computer to a place in which I've named message. I always like to visualize it like it's it's a you know a box that you can open and then put something in. <laughs> um, so however you kind of start to visualize what a variable is. We are we are spatial and visual people. So like my typical analogy of the memory of the computer is a really large storage facility, right? And every single variable is a box you can put stuff inside. That's that's how it, it, it is. Anyway, four basic types of variables. Fundamental, these exist. In fact, all of the fundamental stuff that we'll see in the first few minutes now are shared between every scripting language. It doesn't matter where you come from, if it's Python or not. Um, strings, this is a string. And it's referred to as a string because it's a sequence of characters, right? Um, and the, the fundamental impor important part about the strings is that strings come with codes. The reason why they come with quotes is because the computer is not supposed to read the information inside the quotes. The computer is supposed to uh, understand that information as something to be stored and retrieved, right? Not something to be run. Compared to every other thing that you see here in which the computer is trying to interpret, right? What you type in. So we put quotes, as you would imagine, because if I, anyway, like, uh, and um, if I didn't have a quote here, and I put the code there, right? As you could imagine, like the computer was go is going to try to interpret what Python means. And at this point in time, the computer has no idea what Python means. All right, so the first one is string. The string, one. this is an integer. Integer, simply integer. In integer again, integer. That, that I also will say is probably the number one issue when you first start coding is, you know, your codes might not work because you made a simple spelling error, um, not because you didn't understand, you know, the complexity of what you're doing. Exactly. Um, but it's usually spelling that, that uh, messes up your scripts. All right. A few more things about um, syntax, and I, I'm realizing that I might be running out of time. But anyway, this is important. Syntax-wise, in Python, in order to create a variable, all you need to do is you need to make a name for your variable. That name really only is going to mean something to you and possibly to other humans or other algorithms that might read it, but not to the computer. The computer doesn't care 
what this what this variable means. And then you're gonna just type that uh, equal sign, and you're gonna be, put one or multiple pieces of information inside this, um, this variable. Um, the four basic types that you see here are defined on the spot and stored in that line. In other languages, you might need to initiate a variable first of a particular type, and then you might need to be able, to, after you initiate it, you can place something inside. In Python, all of this happens automatically, and it happens right here. Another thing that I just did, which is you see at the end of, my, of each one of the lines right now, I've added the hashtag, and anything after the hashtag has become green, right? That is an extremely important notion in coding uh, that it's a comment. Uh, the computer will stop reading this line of code after the hashtag. Right? Yeah, comments are just, it's for yourself, for other humans that read this. You know, it's, it's, it often is like something that you, you know, write a little synopsis of what each of the parts are doing. So if you, if you go back to this code in like five years, you know, you, you under, you, you kind of understand what you're doing. Uh, so it's, uh, triple quotes and uh, hashtags are used as ways to kind of write things that you want to read, not the computer. The computer just goes and, you know, uh, goes right past them um, and, you know, doesn't even see them. So comments are really, I think, useful. So I'm writing one more little comment here, which is like a multi-line comment. Comments are extremely important and they're also kind of interesting, let's say in a linguistics even setting that in that they are this kind of in-between language where like English is being embedded into another type of syntax, right? So um, as so you see- Triple quotes can be used for like longer sentences where hashtags are, are just going to, you know, like- um, Rest of the line. Blur out that rest of the line as far as what the computer um, reads. All right, so those are the four basic variables. I'm gonna spend a few more seconds just to say this again, if nobody has coded before, even something as simple as this might produce a little bit of a um, confusion. Um, made up a new variable called i, that i that i is equal to zero, so it's an integer variable. Uh, in line number three, I make it equal to zero. In line number four, I make it equal to uh, one. And of course, by the time I print it, the computer prints one. So this is just an example of how the computer runs through the code. So, you know, in the first in line three, you know, there's an I as a variable, there's a box that gets cr created inside the, the memory of the computer, inside that box is place zero, right? Then we go to the line number four, the computer goes back to that I, you know, and that variable in the box takes out the zero and puts in the one. And then at five, line five, the computer is asking, it is asked to print or call back that variable. And it's called back the most um, recent, recently replaced um, variable. So that's kind of a basic um, you know, outline of how things work in a linear way. Of course, there's other things like um, you know, uh, appended brackets, which- Look, so we're about to go. You know, loop, we'll, we'll do this. Uh, so important thing to recognize here, the, the, the script itself, even though most of the time it runs really fast, most of the time, um, at no given point you should think of a code as running, uh, as running multiple commands simultaneously. simultaneously. And even though, of course, modern computation can run parallel parallel sequences and whatnot, ultimately, as you're being introduced into coding, it's important as, from the programmer point of view to always be aware on how the script is supposed to run, meaning its own timeline, right? Generic code will work one line of code at a time, right? Um, a few more important things about Python is that you can, in fact, um, how should I say? You can recast. Uh, you can recast the variable even if it's of a different kind. Like, I started with an integer and I want to make this thing into a string. The computer is not going to care, right? Uh, other languages deal with this problem differently, right? But like in Python, things are quite flexible and can be recast as such. In fact, sometimes you can even recast them in the sense of like, right now, this is not the number 23, it's the character two and the character three. But because this is a special string, it could all, it can even be translated into a number. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Man. Like, um, uh, maybe you know what? Um, I mean, I have a longer introduction. In fact, I'm not going to spend too much time because we're left with 15 minutes right now. But just to give you guys an idea, the videos that I've shared with you guys here and the code, right? We'll go through every notion of the um, in the introduction into coding into Python, right? Step by step on the pace that, I, that we just did, in fact, even slower to make sure that uh, everyone's on board. So they're, they're numbered and it, it, if you have no idea about, you know, this is your first come, um, you know, intro to coding, I would start with number one and this is gonna, again, expand upon variables and then go to two and three and four. Um, but okay, we just you know also wanna- let's, let's, re let's rethink about this because if we're really gonna release these guys in 15 minutes, what I think I should do guys is, I'm going to show you this file. I'm going to explain to you the logic of this file. Then hopefully we're going to have five to 10 minutes also to discuss what to prepare a little bit for next week. And if you don't mind, I'm more than happy to record a video of the simple code that we have here, like four lines of code and like um, a little bit longer code that we have here, which is roughly 40 lines of code. I can record a video and send it to you at some point tomorrow and you can watch it on your own time in this week in preparation for tomorrow, for, for next week. That's good. So again, Ezio opened up the folder, the file that's called Labyrinth um, 3DM. That's the Rhino file. Um, you know, you have to open that file first and then in the command line type grasshopper. Grasshopper? Grasshopper pops this up and this is where you can open that uh, second file that's called grasshopper labyrinth. Um, so you come here and you say open, right? And then you open the grasshopper file. Typically, we were going to be sending you a Rhino file and a grasshopper file named exactly the same so that you know which file comes with which. Um, Anyway, worst case scenario, you can probably drag it. Um, now, what do we have here? Um, uh, what we have as an underlying piece of geometry that I've already made in Rhino and shared with you is uh, what is called a mesh plane. It's a polygon geometry. And in fact, if you want to create one of your own in Rhino, you type mesh plane. Mesh, mesh plane as a command gives you a couple of uh, parameters as options. In this case, my, my default options are 10 by 10, right? And then I have my grid snap on and I basically create a mesh plane, right? Like 10 by 10 or 50 by 50 as in this case. Now, for the purposes of this specific, let's say algorithmic file, um, the mesh in our case represents a grid, but as a conceptual, let's say game board. And our goal with this file is to create a little labyrinth from like a, a really, let's say, relatively simple logic. Um, the only other input to this, let me, um, there we go. The only other input apart from, <coughs> sorry, this mesh plane is a few points that I don't know if you guys can see, but there's a few points that basically hover above this mesh plane, right? They have a relative position. They don't need to be above, that's like, but the logic behind this is the following. We, in, um, in Grasshopper, I guess I should also mention what is Grasshopper. Maybe I'll expand more on this on the video that I'll send you guys. But in Grasshopper, this is a two-dimensional interface that allows you to uh, make relationship between objects in a random space, code that you write and other components that either retrieve information from the geometry or produce information from the geometry. So it's, it's I would say it's like a it's like a graphic interface of, of, of coding basically. You know you often see in, in Grasshopper there's like an input, you know, that you could you could start to say that as like your variable variables. There's loot, I mean there's functions that you kind of um, craft and then you know there's the output of it. Um, so it, it kind of became very popular, I think, because coding is difficult to get into. And this is the graphic, almost like graphic version of it. Um, but what it allows you to do is make something that you can um, kind of iterate with, uh, you know, in, in an infinite way. Um, and embed the code inside of some of these files. Exactly. I mean, 
uh, they, the very first tutorial that I shared with you guys today started it ended with Python script, but immediately, uh, and I'll send you guys another video for this, immediately the same exact code that we were writing in the edit Python script code editor, you can basically make your own little component here and you can drop, copy paste the code in here and it will more or less work. Now, what, what is happening and what we're looking at? Um, I have taken, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Get this off. I'm just turning my layers off so that we're only looking at what comes from Grasshopper. I have come under parameters, which for Grasshopper, this tab here represents inputs, this black hexagon. I have placed a mesh parameter from here down here. I have selected my mesh and I have come here and said right click, set one mesh. And in doing so, I have created an association between the mesh in Rhino space, in the three-dimensional space, right? And I've made it as an input to my Grasshopper system. You can think about the, these parameters as those boxes again. So you're, you're making a, an empty box that's a variable. inside of Grasshopper, and then you're being asked to put an object from Rhino in it. Um, this is the equivalent of a, like a, a, a graphical representation for a, for a simple variable. Here, uh, instead of setting up one mesh, I have basically selected, sorry, instead of setting up one point, I have selected a bunch of points, right click, set multiple points. Right? So the basic setup here is a board, a grid, and a bunch of points that are anywhere in its space, on it, around it, and so on. What, um, what this, and I guess before I show you guys the labyrinth part, I'm going to show you uh, how you deconstruct this mesh. What is this mesh made out of? So, and let me hide this as well. This mesh, when it's deconstructed, right, into its, into its let's say, elementary um, piece of information, it, this mesh is basically the representation of a series of points in space, specifically 1,681 of them, and It also is the representation of a series of faces as connections between those points, right? So there's two lists of data that come out of a mesh and you can think of a mesh as exactly the collection, the set of these two lists. Co three dimensional coordinates with X, Y, Z information in a list and numbered from zero to 1681. And what this thing says here, which is a representation of the first face, which by the way, is that face right there. This piece of information tells me that the first face is the connection between vertex zero, vertex one, vertex 42 and vertex 41. So like this guy is zero, this guy is one, right? That here is number 42 and number 41. Now. The interesting thing about meshes, and we will be using meshes a lot during the during this class. The interesting thing about meshes is exactly that they are flat. Like they are exactly the organization you see here. Points and connections between them. They don't need to look in a specific way. In fact, because this thing was made by Rhino, it's quite organized. But another mesh that might come from you, might come from me, can have any type of organization. It's completely flat, right? It doesn't need to have a UV. It doesn't uh, need to have a particular topology. Now I'm starting with this because the first task that I have made for you up here is to color this mesh and to color, to put a color on each one of its vertices. And when I say color, I mean grayscale, right? Uh, a gradient uh, color from white to black. Now, how did I do that? I briefly took every vertex information from here, right? And in here, I calculated the average distance. It's, it's simple to understand what, the average distance to all my attractors, right? So let's call these points attractors, not because they're going to attract anything. I'm gonna I call them attractors as a means of influence, right? right? So um, I have a series of points I calculate their average distance from every vertex on the mesh to these attractors. And then I basically multiply that distance with a trigonometric function in a sign. Um, and I have a little slider here. A slider is a piece of interface 
from Grasshopper that allows you to change the point, to change the, this point and effectively affect the number. This input here, if you're familiar with trigonometry, basically represents the what is called an angular frequency. Uh, angular frequency is in relation to a period on the sine on the sine wave. It's not that complicated. But um, anyway, you see the patterns, right? That kind of come from it. In fact, uh, the behavior of any sine, most trigonometric functions, is interesting in as much as you see that after a certain number, it seems to scale up, but its behavior also seems to be quite easily predictable, right? If I go into higher numbers, let's say value 10, it will continue to be predictable forever, right? It will just become larger and larger and larger. But as you do the opposite, as you scale down, you see that you, it scales down, it scales down, and it's clear exactly at this moment in which that there is an interesting interference that starts to happen between the scale of the mesh, the scale of the faces, and the fact that the points are, we don't have enough resolution to keep scaling down, right? So the pattern starts to corrupt itself precisely because of the resolution of the mesh that we have. And more importantly, the further down you go, this discrete notion of every vertex getting a color starts giving you really interesting, I mean, to a certain extent, complex. I would argue this is the beginning of complexity, right? Kind of going back to our general discussion uh, as the interference pattern between a trigonometric function and a discrete system that is trying to capture it. Okay. Play with that. We can we can talk about this more. I even have like a couple of fun papers to look at this. Um, so I started by coloring this mesh. Now let me hide this color and show you the second part of the algorithm. The second part of the algorithm, basically, without going into the script itself, uh, and I'll, I'll just explain the logic. What happens here is that I go to every vertex on the mesh. So we literally start marching the vertices. I go to the first one, the second one, one by one. And from each one of these vertices, I find the closest attractor. So for this guy, the closest attractor is that one, actually. And then I look at its neighbors. And that's the part that the script does. The script identifies all the other points that are close connected to my current vertex and finds which one of these green points is the closest to the attractor. And ultimately, all it does is it makes a single line from this to the one that is closest to the attractor. That's it. Go to the next one. Okay. So the rule is, from the point of view of the vertex, look to your neighbors, find which neighbor is closest to one of the goals, make a line to your neighbor. Go to the next one. Collectively, all of these lines, right, of course, start to point towards the respective attractors, right, as you see here. And of course, if I move these points around, the pattern is going to adjust accordingly, right? And some points, there is also kind of smooth, let's say, transitions between them, but Overall, I hope this logic kind of more or less makes sense, right? I wanted to get a general direction towards these points, towards these attractors. Um, and finally, finally, from all of these points, going back to the notion of randomness that somebody was asking before, right? I randomly reduce my lines. So I start deleting from the overall pattern. And this slider allows you to delete less or to delete more randomly. That's where randomness kind of comes into our script right now. And the final thing that I do um, is based on the sign, uh, based on the sign equation that I was uh, showing you right before, right? Like the color that I was showing you before. I rotate the wall 90 degrees or I don't rotate the wall 90 degrees, right? So we started from that pattern. The pattern was always pointing towards the attractors in order to add 
a level of complexity into uh, the finding of these particular uh, tractors, right? Um, we change the direction of this kind of over the labyrinth and everything should be kind of more or less live, lively updated here. Right? Accordingly. All right. 128. So a little bit about homework? Yes. <laughs> Um, look, we want to engage, the reason why we share with you this um, file of a labyrinth, and of course, as you realize, it's not, it's not exactly, let's say, it's just a labyrinth, I mean, it's, it's a typological representation of the labyrinth, but what we also find interesting as a means of introduction uh, of this specific setup is that it introduces you to a notion of labyrinth while actually just looking at the structure of data, right, and the interference between to relatively simple systems. Uh, an interference system, <clears throat> the black and white that I have in the background, and a general direction towards specific goals, and how these two systems with a relative communication with each other produce something that you can even potentially lose yourself into. Um, we would love if you guys come back with both uh, initial ideas um, for two-dimensional simple patterns and behavior of those patterns. And you can express it as such, just two-dimensional patterns that follow a simple logic over and over again and hopefully get a complex pattern. And we can call it a labyrinth just for next week. And what we'll do next week is we'll be bringing this geometry uh, inside of Unity and walking around it in, in a, a in game a, environment. Yeah, in, yeah. All right, so this should be, I mean, it's a, it's a plug and play uh, kind of situation where your inputs are pretty simple. Um, I will send you guys appended videos for explaining this at length. It also kind of precursors how these types of um, Python uh, codes can be embedded within kind of a dynamic input uh, logic. Um, and yeah, it would be great if, you know, when we meet next week is if we could see some of these, that you guys experiment with this um, and then we'll walk, we'll build on this uh, kind of Python tutorial, but we'll walk you through how to, how to take it into a game environment. Let's just say there's a couple of questions in the chat. And of course, guys, feel free to jump on if you have any questions, like unmute yourself directly. Um, if you have experience in any other coding environment uh, that you don't need to rely on our tutorials to produce any of the exercises we'll be looking together. We'll be giving you guys examples, uh, hopefully both set up, let's say the conceptual agenda, but also to a certain extent, give you plug and play tools so that you can engage with the class. But if, for example, you have your own Linux machine and you know how to code in Python better, I mean, do it in any coding environment you want. Uh, we need to establish something so we can all have at least a, a base, right? Uh, that we can collaborate, but you're welcome to. In fact, I, I speak a little bit of Java. I definitely have written a lot of processing. I can probably even help you with a little bit of C. Um, so we'll, we'll, find, we'll find the appropriate environment in order to code together. Any last questions? Not so much. OK. Uh, just one more thing. We'll be um, sending in an a email with um, the, the spreadsheet where we can sign up for presentations after this class. Excellent. Um, it was a real pleasure uh, meeting all of you guys. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, the, the rest of the meetings and hopefully um, we also have our Discord. I, I'll, we'll see how the next few days uh, between WhatsApp, Discord and Slack and all the other stuff that we are introduced. We'll see which one goes forward, but there are multiple lines of communication. Um, if you need to contact us, uh, send you the email uh, and my Discord. I'm, we're 24 seven online. so. Hopefully, see you guys soon. It's super nice to meet everyone. It's, yes, yeah, it's, it's an amazing group of people. Um, so, yeah, we, we'll pro probably not make the lecture part as long next time <laughs> and be more in the applied part <laughs> exactly. for next week. All right, beautiful. Are there any kind of questions and 
before we let you guys go. And again, feel free to reach out on Discord um, if you guys have any like any issues, uh, plug and play with those. And I have a quick question just about the readings. Um, because you, you uploaded like uh, a few books and I was wondering whether there were like parts of those that you thought we ought to read. Um, so when I, when I, very good question, thanks. Uh, thank you, Linda. Um, whenever I've uploaded the whole book, I would expect that you guys read the introduction. If it's not the introduction, I will send you another, uh, another comment about it. But obviously I gave you guys the whole book because if you get captured, if you get captured by the introduction, keep reading. And yeah, so the next, for, for next week? Um, it's just the first week, right? So like uh, we've organized our readings in weeks and we're looking into informal. In fact, informal is not a whole book, it's a part of it. The paper by Kao Chu, um, Melanie Mitchell, read the introduction and elements by Euclid. Definitely read the introduction. After a while, it gets a little bit too uh, technical, but I, I have a question. Euclid is exceptional. Sorry, that's another uh, question. So yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, it's about the, the, the presentations and the, the assignments will be like our, our, our work in the, the renals or like presentations together with the text and, and something like that. What, what, what are going to be our presentations and, and assignments? Because it is usually also like uh, the, the could be a, a, the the moderator, uh, the the new center moderator could also I, I I don't know like put the the the, the spreadsheet and what are we gonna do and stuff like that. It's a little bit of a logistical. Thank you for uh, like the question, Zenobio. Is um, very good question. I mean, let's say because I it's hard for me to anticipate what is your each uh, each one of your uh, kind of relation with CAD environment, why not. Definitely not for the first week. It's not required that you work in Rhino. Honestly, ideas can come in many forms, including sketches, whatever software environment you feel uh, comfortable in. Try to code it in Rhino, of course, uh, but let's see how this thing goes and if you need more resources from me in order to make this happen. Um, we can follow up with an email and be a little bit more precise in terms of deliverables, right? But I would expect that for the first week, when we come back next weekend, I'm going to allow you guys to share your screen and share your ideas through your screen with whichever um, medium you can. Sounds good. It's not like, especially for the first week, as we begin to address, let's say, rule sets, it's even less important that we code them immediately. You can just come with ideas about rule sets and how to, cre to create this kind of labyrinth or coded environment. Uh, and we'll be here to help as well. So. Sounds good? Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Cool. Awesome, awesome. Um, Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Looking forward to seeing you guys next week. And we'll be reaching out with them now. Thank you, bye. Thank you.